Hey guys, you've been asking some really great questions in the comments of the last few videos. A lot of them seem kind of simple on the surface, but they touch on some really great technical and creative information that's a little bit deeper. So I want to get in depth. I want to answer a whole bunch of them right now. Let's dive right in. I like the idea of three speakers set up for film work. I would say that's necessary. Thoughts on having a center speaker be a separate make and model, or is that a bad idea? And if you're working on something like Genelex or Adams or the JBL 705s, would a sub be helpful or hurtful? Okay. Okay, so generally speaking, you do want to have the same make and model of speaker for at least your left, center, and right. And that way, when you're working, you kind of have the same expectation that each speaker sounds the same, it performs the same, and as you're panning and moving sounds throughout your space, you'll be able to get a good and consistent representation of what those are like. However, it always, of course, comes down to just knowing your system and knowing how it translates. So is it the end of the world if you don't have the exact same setup? No, not necessarily, but I'd say it's an easier thing to work within if you match your speakers. Now, when it comes to using an LFE or a subwoofer, the long and short of it is it kind of depends. It's generally a good idea to have good low-end representation so you can hear what your low frequencies are doing clearly, but if you have a really small room, you may not necessarily need a sub to push that kind of air, but if you're delivering to a theatrical format or you're planning on mixing for a theatrical space, you definitely need a sub because of course you're going to be pushing that kind of air once you get to a theater and having the ability to work with that as you're cutting and maybe pre-dubbing sounds in a smaller room is going to be super helpful for translation. But again, it totally depends on what you're doing. If you're a dialogue editor, there is barely ever going to be a time where you want to run dialogue out of a subwoofer. It just doesn't really happen. If you're a sound effects editor, you might want one just so you can push air in the way that maybe a theatrical dub stage or a small TV stage is going to. And of course, if you're working on music, it might be a good idea to augment your low-end response with a subwoofer so that you can just get a little bit more punch and a little bit more clarity out of your bottom frequencies, and you'll be able to hear what your low-end is doing a little bit better. Again, that's just dealing with translations so that you don't have to guess a whole lot while using maybe smaller speakers that don't reproduce those sounds. All right, next question from the Flashda. When editing Foley effects into a mix, what happens to the original production effects? Are they lowered in volume or replaced with room tone from set? So that's a great question, and that totally depends on how well the production audio from set is recorded. Standard operating procedure with Foley at the major level is pretty much every sound that could possibly be made is covered. Every footstep is walked, every hand pat, every cup pickup, every every coffee sip, every cigarette pull, everything that you can think of is going to be redone on a Foley stage just so they can get that clarity and quality and give you a more cinematic and hyper real experience. However, if production audio is really good, we'll rely on that and we don't have to necessarily use Foley because again, that's, that's supplemental to stuff that's already been recorded well in theory. There are definitely times where you want to kind of sweeten the production audio, you know, if footsteps are not recorded well, which they usually aren't recorded at all, having footsteps there is going to be helpful. But if, you know, one person is alone in a room and they've got some really clear, crisp footsteps that happen to be caught on set, I don't want to replace that. I don't want to have to go through the process of recording more, so I'm just going to use that. The next question is from Alarm Clock Films, asking, I've been using Pro Tools on several projects, but find the overall software not to be very professional. And by this, I mean I expect it to work flawlessly, without errors, every single time I use it, without fail. And I've done a little bit of talking about software and hardware, just tools getting out of the way so that you can be creative with them. And as someone who wants to work in the field professionally, I find it hard to want to learn a piece of software that's so frustrating. Welcome to the club, dude. Is Avid working on this software to make it better, less buggy and less random errors? And basically, is there anything that can just work? The answer to that is no. Nothing just works right out of the box. And I spent a lot of time kind of in my earlier days trying to chase down the perfect solution to a lot of the errors that I was encountering. At the end of the day, no software is gonna be perfect. This kind of takes me back to the days of like the Mac versus PC argument, which after a while, I ended up getting kind of tired of that and realizing that it's not really about the tools, it's about how you use them and what you use them for. And Pro Tools is just simply another tool that happens to be the most commonplace tool in the upper levels of the industry in terms of working with sound. So like it or not, if you want to be working at major level sorts of stuff or you want to be shooting for that kind of quality, Pro Tools is sort of the only game in town that you'll find everywhere. Now, that's not to say that things like Nuendo or Logic or any of the other answers that are out there to these sorts of professional audio problems 
aren't great. It's just that Avid and Pro Tools have kind of dominated the market in post-production specifically. And so if you want to work in that realm, that's kind of what you have to learn. Now, that being said, Pro Tools has been pretty stable for me for the last little while. And with the exception of a few really egregious errors that you can expect from pretty much any software company, I haven't had too many problems, especially when you're running really complex configurations like 10 Pro Tools rigs feeding off of a master sync with a projector and Adobe RMU working in Atmos. There really isn't any other game in town besides Pro Tools that can do that reliably and consistently. But bottom line, I feel like the real answer to this question is at the end of the day, it doesn't necessarily matter what software you want to use that you feel most comfortable with. It only matters if you can get the quality and the level of creativity that you want out of the software. So if Reaper works for you, then use Reaper. If Nuendo works for you, then use Nuendo. It doesn't really matter that much until you start collaborating with other teams. And at that point, you all want to be on the same system consistently to the extent that you can be. And again, in the majors, in, in kind of the bigger studio environments, Pro Tools is what you're going to find, so if that's the level that you want to be working at, if that's the environment you want to be working at, or the, the system that you want to be a part of, Pro Tools is the thing to know. Another specific Pro Tools question from SoundArts Online, I cannot edit video in Pro Tools, and what are the settings you recommend to get it to work? So Pro Tools is, of course, not a video editing program. But on top of that, there are a couple of different versions of Pro Tools that allow you to do rudimentary video editing, but more as a problem solver than actually cutting picture. And this is one of those, you don't necessarily want one piece of software to do it all. I get the Swiss Army knife, you know, be able to turn on a dime and switch between picture editorial versus color correction versus sound editing versus deliverables, but it's kind of like the jack of all trades, master of none idea. If you have a piece of software that's trying to do everything, and I think actually DaVinci Resolve is a good example of this, it's going to be really good at a couple of those things. And it's not going to be great for the rest of them. And I think Fairlight's integration with DaVinci is probably a good example of this, because Again, it's, it's good enough to work with at a basic level, but in terms of getting really granular with automation and sound design and routing and all the various configurations of running, you know, again, six, seven different Pro Tools systems and a recording system and a projector, DaVinci can't really hang with that. Most softwares can't really hang with that. So I guess to this I'd say use the right tools for the task at hand. If you want to work specifically with sound, any of the DAWs are going to be great. Reaper, Nuendo, Pro Tools, etc. They're all they're all going to do the job. And when it comes to picture, obviously you want something that's going to be more robust and it's kind of built to handle that. Pro Tools, the only time I find myself cutting picture is when I'm doing conforms, and it's really good to have the capability to do that since that's kind of a necessity, but otherwise... I'm not editing picture in Pro Tools, I'm not sure why you'd want to. Next question is from Cute Blast Samo. What kind of audio interface do you use in the studio for recording and monitoring? Uh, I am not a great example of cutting edge technology when it comes to interfaces. I'm using an old Avid MBox Pro 3, and basically I wanted it because it's got the ability to do 5.1 surround and enough microphone inputs that I can record vocals or voiceover or foley or what have you, it gets the job done. If I upgrade to anything in the near future, I'm probably going to be looking at Universal Audio's Apollo series. I think those sound really, really awesome, and I like the onboard plug-in processing and various different emulations of old analog hardware. But for the time being, I'm just working again with that Mbox 3 Pro, and it does the job. I don't need anything else out of it. And one last question from Ajushi Photography. Is any one plug-in type better than the other? For instance, do you always use VS T's or AU versions of plugins. So this is a little bit technical. I think it's really interesting. VST is virtual studio technology. AU is audio units, which is Mac only. Windows uses VSTs in a lot of their softwares, but there are plenty of different plugin types. Pro Tools using AAX. It used to be RTAS, that kind of thing. There isn't really any big difference that I've personally found between sound quality in VSTs versus AU versus AAX. Where the differences lie tends to be in the audio engine of the host software. Pro Tools, as a DAW, has a certain sound. When you, when you push the software a little bit further than kind of the optimal resources that it's supposed to take up, it starts degrading a little bit, and it's a little bit weird. And, you know, in comparison, something like Cubase or Harrison's Mixbus, 
those sound really good. They're good sounding DAWs. That doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the plugins that you use. It's just the architecture of the audio engine running the software. Same thing with something like Premiere or Audition. You'll have to compare those kinds of things and, and hear for yourselves, but each software does it slightly differently. Now, between VST and audio units, I haven't heard any real big difference. One of the things that I think is really fascinating, I do a lot of sound editing and sound design in Pro Tools, but I use a companion software called SoundMiner to manage my whole sound effects library, which is over a million sounds at this point. It's, it's kind of unruly, but you need that level of craziness as a sound editor doing this sort of stuff. So I do all my sound design using VST processing in SoundMiner for the most part, because I can get, using the exact same plugins, better quality sounds than doing the exact same thing in Pro Tools. So kind of an interesting discrepancy, and again, it doesn't necessarily have to do with VST versus AAX versus AU versus whatever. It's more about what software you're using to host those plugins in. All right, that about wraps it up. I hope this was information that was useful to you guys. I know some of these are more technical deep dives than they appear to be on the surface, so please keep the questions coming in the comments. Don't forget to hit like, hit subscribe, share the video if you feel like it. I'm over on Instagram at AXK, so come follow me over there. And as always, thanks for watching.